So this is great. This is this is a really serious thing, but it also includes a really funny clip. There was a debate audience that broke out in an uncontrollable fit of laughter when a Republican Senate candidate tried to claim that Donald Trump has been, quote, standing up to Russia, which, of course, he hasn't been doing. He's been doing the opposite of that. I'm going to play the clip for you. And this is part of the sort of Orwellian newspeak where they have straight up started to say the opposite of what is going on. And this is now leaking over to Senate candidates who are Trumpists, including Republican Senate nominee Corey Stewart, who's running in Virginia against incumbent Democratic Senator Tim Kaine. Uh, And Tim Kaine, of course, during the debate, he talked about Russian aggression during the 2016 election, undeniable at this point. He talked about Russian aggression during Barack Obama's presidency, including the invasion of Crimea, downing an aircraft over Ukraine. Here is how Corey Stewart responded. And of course, laughter from both the audience and Tim Kaine in response. He was noticeably silent. Uh, when the Russians shot down a Malaysian airliner when President Obama was in office. He was noticeably silent when the Russians invaded the Crimea when President Obama was in office. We have a president who is standing up to the Russians. And now, Senator Kane, (laughs) now we have... Now we have Senator Kane. Now we have Senator Kane. I actually think that a straight up uncontrolled fit of laughter is a pretty damn good way to challenge these types of nonsense claims. It's it's actually kind of powerful. Imagine if when candidates say such ridiculous things, instead of trying to fight it point by point when they've thrown out 10 lies in a minute and convince people, which you won't be able to do, right? If the entire room simply starts laughing hysterically at the obvious lies and then you just move on, It starts to take on an air of this childish ignorance from these people is so dumb and so inaccurate that it's actually funny. It doesn't even require a response. And this is not normally my view, right? My view is ad hominems aren't arguments and you need to take the arguments on at their core. But when the arguments are not even based in fact, and this is something that over the weekend, a number of interesting articles were written uh, in the context of Holocaust denial and how Holocaust denial should be managed on online forums because you're fundamentally not going to be able to actually fight it with facts because the people who are committed to Holocaust denial are not going to be influenced by facts. What about just laughing? And if they can say it themselves, right, something like Trump is tough on Russia without cringing or getting red in the face, How are you going to convince them that they're just simply wrong? So maybe you do laugh off the entire thing because it's an utterly condescending way that could actually show that there's a total absence of logic and rationality, laughter and ridicule as the tactic instead of logic and rationality. And these types of uh, administration officials and candidates they aren't based in logic and they're not based in rationality. So you can't use those tools against them. They care about looking tough and acting tough and imposing their view on others and imposing their inaccurate views on others. So maybe just by laughing at them, you make them look silly and their ideas hopefully go nowhere. Send me your thoughts about the laughter technique. And do you think that it would be effective not in changing their minds? Their minds aren't going to be changed but in exposing the lack of believability about the nonsense that they're spewing to others, to people in the crowd, to people who watch this stuff on TV. Send me your thoughts about that. So I've said before, I don't really believe in using this type of language as uh, legitimate political language, but but it sort of is the right language to use here. Trump's been totally cucked by Vladimir Putin. And I know that Pat uh, gets very, very upset when I use that kind of language. And he, he pulls me aside after the show. And we often have to have a conversation that that embarrasses Max because of how how crazy it gets. But he's been totally cucked by Putin, who has rejected Trump's invitation to the White House and to Washington, D.C. One of the things that came out of the Helsinki summit, other than the sort of undeniable, obvious confirmation that Trump is a total captive of Vladimir Putin's, is that Trump wants Putin at the White House. They were calling it a sort of second summit, but this time not on neutral ground like Helsinki, uh, but rather on Putin, uh, sorry, (laughs) Freudian slip, on Trump's turf, Washington, D.C., in the United States. And it wasn't really clear whether this was a good idea or a bad idea until yesterday when Russia announced that they're going to reject the invitation. They're rejecting Trump's offer for a summit, and it is making Trump once again look 
like the humiliated fool that he is getting played by the world leaders all over the world. And when you think about one of Putin's top goals as meddling in the 2016 election to destabilize American democracy and to make Russia uh, seem like a power player, the alpha around the world. This is the exact message that is reinforced when Russia says, oh, Trump invited Putin to the White House. No, thanks. This isn't the right time. And for the time being, Russia is saying no. Trump, uh, uh, tr top Putin Kremlin aide Yuri Ushakov said, quote, after the summit, you know what kind of atmosphere there is around its outcome. I think it would be wise to let the dust settle and then we can discuss all these questions in a business like way, but not now. And this invitation was not some random offhanded statement from Trump. Just last week, Trump and White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders said preparations were already underway for the visit, right? You, you don't say you're already preparing for the visit unless you're thinking about it as a serious thing. And now Putin says, nah, can't be bothered right now. May, maybe some other time. Trump even tweeted about it last week, saying the summit with Russia was a great success, except with the real enemy of the people, the fake news media. I look forward to our second meeting so that we can start implementing some of the many things discussed, including stopping terrorism, security for Israel, nuclear proliferation, cyber attacks, trade, Ukraine, Middle East peace, North Korea and more. There are many answers, some easy and some hard to these problems, but they can all be solved. Apparently not with Putin at the White House, though. Ouch. Totally played once again, right? Putin is kind of like the pickup artist and Trump is the naive youngster who thinks he's such a nice guy. Why? Why wouldn't I go on another date with I him? was thinking that this was going to stir up Trump's daddy issues, right? I think yeah. Trump has one of those complexes where his dad never truly accepted him. Yeah. So he was always upset with himself, right? Had to have his dad bail him out so many times with his business endeavors. Right. Kind of like the same thing, right? If we think that Trump is Putin working for Putin and yet Putin won't even visit the White House, that's kind of shame him. The art of the deal. This guy, I mean, can you think of a worse deal maker than Trump in politics? Putin is just straight up toying with the guy. But we got along so well in Helsinki and now he says he doesn't want to play in my sandbox. How many times will Trump <laughs> get humiliated? by Putin before the Trumpists say enough is enough. This guy is embarrassing our country. Unfortunately, it's a very, very high number. I don't think I don't think we're anywhere close to the number of times Trump needs to get humiliated by Putin before the Trumpist will say this might not be working out as well as the so-called renewed friendship with Russia was supposed to be working out. The, the, the Trumpists don't care. They're going to well, stick with them. It could have been Russia who declined the information, the invitation. It could have been Israel who declined the invitation. It could have been a 400 pound man sitting on a bed somewhere. Who Listen, knows? There's nearly 200 countries out there. So the fact that Russia is not coming to Washington, D.C. could actually relate to Equatorial Guinea's decision or maybe the Chilean president made the call. Could be anybody. Tons of countries out there, as Donald Trump often likes to say. We have the first casualty from Sasha Baron Cohen's new show, Who is America? Baron Cohen is, of course, the actor who has developed such characters as Ali G, Borat, Bruno. And in this new show that he has on Showtime, he plays a, a new character. He's an Israeli firearms instructor named Iran Morad, who claims to support everything from burqa bans to training four year olds to use firearms. And he has gotten some really high profile interviews, Pat including everybody from um, I don't even know where Bernie to start. Sanders, Bernie Sanders, Ohio, Sarah Palin, I think, yeah. uh, realized that something wasn't Roy right. Moore. So she bailed. Roy Moore was interviewed by him. And today we have the first casualty, which is Jason Spencer. Jason Spencer is a Georgia state lawmaker. He was apparently so taken with Colonel Iran Murad that he ended up supporting a burqa ban, yelling the N word incessantly pretending to be an Asian tourist during which he adopted a stereotypical Asian accent and at one point actually dropped his pants to quote use his buttocks to intimidate Isis. Here is a piece of the video N word warning. But uh, I think that his buttocks is going to be blurred out for people that are watching. Take a look at this. Because of who you are, you could be the victim of kidnapping by Isis. You have two seconds <laughs> to attract attention. <laughs> How do you attract attention? Ready to start screaming? Take your clothes off? In America, there is one forbidden word. It is the N-word. 
Now, I am going to be the terrorist. You have three seconds to attract attention. Go! Nigger! 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 What? Nigger! Are you crazy? The N-word is noony. Not this word. This word is disgusting. Got it. ISIS are scared of being seen as homo. You know what it means, uh, homo? Yeah, yeah. If your buttock touch them, it means they have become a... Homosexual. Now I am going to teach you how to use your buttocks to intimidate ISIS. Huh. Show me the buttock. No, trousers down. Okay, go. America! Good, one more time, but louder with America. America! <laughs> Good. We say in the Mossad, I mean not in the Mossad, if you want to win, you show some skin. Okay. Okay, show it to me. Now, try to touch me. I'll touch you, I'll touch you with my buttocks. I'll touch you, you better drop the gun or I'll touch you. USA! Okay, stop. You have to remind me. If I touch you, you will become a homosexual. Okay. Okay? Now, try to touch me. Go! Ah, ah, ah. Go, 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 go! Go! Ah, ah, ah. Go, go! go. Ah, ah. USA! USA, motherfucker! Okay, yes or no? You show me your weapon. Go! I'll touch you. I'll make you a homosexual. You drop that gun right now. USA! Okay. USA! The most incredible thing is that when you watch this clip, Spencer's behavior is so insane and so outrageous that it's actually hard to believe he's not an actor and that this is all scripted. It's so whack that it seems like Spencer is working for the show, but he wasn't. And he's now resigning after this. He is blaming Sasha Baron Cohen, saying that he was taken advantage of. He put out a statement through the Atlanta Journal Constitution saying that, quote, in posing as an Israeli agent, Cohen pretended to offer self-defense exercises. As uncomfortable as I was to participate, I agreed to understanding that these, quote, techniques were meant to help me and others fend off what I believed was an inevitable attack. I deeply regret the language I used at Cohen's request, as well as my participation in the class in general. If I had not been so distracted by my fears, I never would have agreed to participate in the first place. Obviously, the first thing anybody does when they believe that their family may be at risk is you go somewhere and you start yelling the N word out incessantly like you're having a grand old party. And he's framed himself as just being so scared that he was scared into participating because of fear for his family. Imagine just for a second. OK, here's what I was thinking about, Pat. If you can get Jason Spencer to say on camera the N word like it's a party and fake an Asian accent. What is he willing to do behind the scenes and what could a lobbyist get him to do by offering him some money? Yeah, I mean, he was totally exposed here, right? I don't think I, I think he does genuinely believe these things deep down and would say these things in private. I agree. Normally you wouldn't do that on camera, but he was duped here. And I think that's the genius of Sasha Baron Cohen. We are better off that Jason Spencer is resigning. Now, a lot of people do have a problem with what Sasha Baron Cohen is doing. They're saying it, you you are misrepresenting the person that you are and thus the entire thing is sort of dishonest at its base. I don't know that that's a good that could be an argument against Sasha Baron Cohen's uh, uh, format, right? That how he does what he does with Ali G Borat, whoever. But that's not a defense of Jason Spencer, because I don't care what costume Sasha Baron Cohen puts on. I'm not going to start yelling the N word out incessantly, right? It's yeah. it just not going to happen. I don't care what costume or who he claims to be. Yeah, I mean, your true colors are revealed here, and some people are failing the test, others are passing the test. That's like correct. Bernie Sanders, for example, he wasn't fooled by it. He could kind of pick up on the fact that Sasha was playing a character. And even Sarah Palin, I mean, she, she as, as we're told, Sarah Palin identified that uh, the person claiming to be a so-called veteran of the service was actually Sasha Baron Cohen and was not a, a former service member and walked out of the interview. Not everybody is falling for this stuff, and we are all better off with Jason Spencer resigning. I think that there is no question about that. If you disagree that Spencer should have to resign as a result of this, please let me know, and you can discuss it on the David Pakman Show subreddit at davidpakman.com slash R-E-D-D-I-T. What's been interesting since Trump became president is the number of Republicans who are willing to go out there and say, I disagree with the president on this. The president is wrong about this. Jeff Flake, John McCain, 
uh, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, all of those people. Hell, Lindsey Graham at one point, Marco Rubio the other day. They're all willing to come out there and say, I disagree with the president on issue X, Y, or Z, or he took a wrong approach to his uh, summit with Putin. Unfortunately, none of these Republicans, aside from maybe giving a short interview talking about how bad the president did, are actually willing to stand up for him. Lindsey Graham, in the early days of this administration, happened to be one of the biggest anti-Trump voices in the U.S. Senate. And then he started going golfing with the president and suddenly his tune changed. I mean, it was almost overnight. The guy left the golf course and then started talking about how great Donald Trump was. But then a few months went by, no more golf invites. So he started going after him a little bit more. Same thing with Jeff Flake, right? Jeff Flake, super loud, anti-Trump guy. And yet 16 different times at least, that Jeff Flake has said, I disagree with the president on this and we cannot stand for it. He's ended up either backing down or voting for the specific thing or person that he said was so awful. There is no real never Trump Republican in Washington, DC. They don't actually exist. What does exist is a cabal of Republicans who understand that some of them have to face reelection. Some of them are ending their careers and don't want to be looked upon negatively by the American public. Either way, they're trying to do two things at once. And one is to give this public face of a person who's not going to take it, a person who doesn't stand for what Trump stands for. But then we have the very private face. Because after all, let's, let's be perfectly honest here. Most Americans don't go and check the voting records. You might see it occasionally come up in a campaign ad, so-and-so voted for this. Most of it is shrouded in uh, you know, language that paints it one way when in fact it's another. So nobody goes back and checks the voting records, or very few people do, not enough people do. That gives these never Trump Republicans the clearance to say one thing publicly and then do a different thing privately. And that is what we're seeing today. And it's not just they won't protect Mueller. It's not just that they voted down the uh, uh, congressional legislation that would have prevented Donald Trump from starting this trade war. It's not just that they won't let that interpreter from that Putin meeting last week come and testify before Congress. It's all of it. These Republicans today have been given so many opportunities to be heroes. I mean, that's what they don't even understand. These guys could have been the ones to save the day. They could have been the ones calling for that interpreter from the Putin meeting to come, uh, come to Congress. They could have been the ones to save the jobs that are being lost now from the trade wars had they acted. But they don't, and it's because they're afraid. They've seen what's happened to Jeff Flake through Donald Trump's Twitter attacks. They've seen what ha- what's happened to John McCain through the, the same Twitter attacks. And all that is his words. Neither of those men have actually been punished in any way by Donald Trump because he can't actually do it. He just goes on Twitter, makes fun of them. People in his administration make fun of them. And that's the end of it. But even the threat of just being made fun of by the president on Twitter is enough to make these Republicans completely complicit with everything that this man has done. The only way to solve this problem is to vote them out. They're not going to come around. They're not going to suddenly realize, oh, wait, yeah, I forgot to do everything that I said I was going to do against you. It'll never happen. None of these Republicans are ever going to be the heroes that we need them to be, even though they've had plenty of opportunity to do it. If they wanted to, they could have done it months ago, but every single one of them failed to do it. I'm Farron Cousins, and for David Pakman today, we'll be right back. So let's continue our discussion. We've got the NRA. We've got this 29-year-old Russian agent named Maria Butina, who's now been indicted for working on behalf of Russia in the United States without being a registered foreign agent. We have a, a, a viewer of The David Pakman Show who actually was at a class with Maria Butina and exchanged emails with her, and he sent them to me, and I've been reviewing them, and I don't know whether they, they're really relevant for the show. I don't know if he's okay with me showing them to you, but I've been reviewing a lot of the 
uh, activity that Maria Butina has been involved in. And she appears to be at least one of the conduits between the Russians and the Trump campaign via the NRA. And that's a connection that we've been following for months. So I already told you in the last story that the same day of Maria Butina's indictment, the Trump treasury headed by Steven Mnuchin decided to change a rule to make it easier to hide the donors of dark money to organizations just like the NRA. Convenient coincidence, okay. Well, yesterday we learned that it wasn't just the NRA that Maria Butina was meeting, meeting with. It wasn't just showing up at a Trump event and asking Trump a question about easing Russian sanctions. But Reuters is now reporting that Maria Butina also met with two senior officials at the United States Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department, along with other visiting Russian officials. I'm not saying these things are related, but this stinks really, really badly. And it now also pulls in specifically Alexander Torshin, who happens to be the exact Russian rich dude who's already suspected of being a funder of Trump's campaign via the NRA. Multiple people familiar with the meetings involving Butina and the Treasury and the Fed have confirmed that, including Americans who are connected to those meetings. So there is nothing being questioned about whether these meetings took place. So consider what we now know with regard to Maria Butina. Number one, Maria Butina met with high ranking NRA officials. And of course, we know that the NRA was funneling money to the Trump campaign. Number two, Maria Butina met with U.S. Treasury and Federal Reserve officials. Number three, the Treasury relaxed reporting requirements of NRA donor information within 48 hours of Maria Butina's arrest. And number four, Butina worked for NRA tied Putin connected Russian Alexander Torshin. I also increasingly don't understand how a 20 something year old Russian gets meeting after meeting with NRA higher up, Treasury higher up, Federal Reserve higher up, and nobody seems to raise an eyebrow. And the broader picture here is twofold. Number one, we now realize that Russia deployed the full spectrum of infiltration techniques. You have Russians teasing Trump campaign officials and Trump's own family, including Donald Trump Jr. and Kushner with dirt on Hillary, and it got them meetings at Trump Tower. You have the messing with the voting systems by Russia in something like 20 or more states and actually accessing the voting systems in at least one state, uh, as far as the latest reports indicate. You have infiltration of traditionally right wing organizations like the NRA, and the use of those organizations as conduits to both the Republican Party's easing of their position on Russia and to the Trump campaign itself. And then lastly, and some people don't like this, we don't know to what extent Maria Butina may have used sex to obtain even more than we know about, right? So like, it's not, uh, uh, it, it's not sexist to say that Maria Butina may have used sex in order to develop some of the uh, connections that she did. It, it's just a widely used tactic by Russia and other intelligence services. And it's one of the reasons why um, a, a woman operating in a world that is disproportionately uh, men granting access, it wouldn't be shocking to think that that may be why this 20 something woman with no real credentials to speak of was able to get this level of access. And it's it's not sexist. And in fact, I don't even know if we need to call it infiltration when it seems like many of these parties, the Trump campaign, the Republican Party, the NRA, among others, willingly welcomed Maria Butina. So we're going to learn some incredible things in the next few months. This is only the start. And I really do want to hear from our from, from the audience, particularly from the Russia skeptics on this. When you see the various modes of infiltration that took place, working directly with the Trump campaign, working through conduits like the NRA and others, using uh, individuals like Maria Butina to meet with folks at everywhere from the Federal Reserve and the Treasury to the NRA. How at this point can anybody still be a so-called Russia skeptic? Let me know. This is a topic of discussion on the David Pakman Show subreddit at davidpakman.com slash R-E-D-D-I-T. And we've got a fantastic program for you today. You don't have to pretend that Iran was a sensible, moderate, democratic, 
regime to admit the truth, which is that the Obama-Iran deal has actually worked out pretty well for years at this point. And I was a critic of some aspects of that deal when it was first signed, but I was overall a supporter of the deal. And in fact, when I was on Fox News last week, the right wing guest, as well as the host who kind of teamed up on me, were arguing that Donald Trump deserves credit for nine months without a North Korean missile test. And if that's true, then when it comes to the Iran deal, clearly President Obama deserved and arguably still deserves credit for year after year after year of Iran not testing nukes and not doing nuclear advancement and not violating the terms of that deal. And what we now have is Iran threatening war against the United States and threatening Donald Trump specifically with what they're calling the mother of all wars after Donald Trump has become increasingly hostile to Iran and on his position with regard to the Iranian regime, including the recent announcement, which we covered extensively about Donald Trump planning to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal, even though as far as 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 we know, as far as inspectors know, as far as the checks and balances that exist as part of that deal, Iran hasn't violated the terms of the deal. So there's a few different layers of analysis here. Number one, big picture, remember that it was Hillary Clinton who we were told was going to get us into wars. But here is yet another country uh, with which Donald Trump is inching closer to a war. So let's get to what the Iranian president said. And of course, Donald Trump has responded, as he often does on Twitter. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, saying yesterday, quote, don't play with fire or you will regret. Iranian people are the master and they will never bow to anyone. America should know peace with Iran is the mother of all peace. But he later threatened in the statement that war with Iran is the mother of all wars. And of course, Donald Trump, predictably, and this may even have been a, a calculated decision by Iran, knowing that Donald Trump is unable to resist uh, acting like a normal person because he's not one. And Trump immediately responding exactly as we would expect on Twitter with more threats, saying to Iranian President Rouhani, never, this is all in caps, by the way, if you're, if you're not looking at this, never ever threaten the United States again or you will suffer consequences, the likes of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. We are no longer a country, I guess that's a reference to Obama, that will stand for your demented words of violence and death, be cautious. This is an issue where the right is probably going to successfully turn it around and say things like, look, this is proof that Iran is unhinged and belligerent. And so we should get out of the Iran deal. And Trump is right to be tough with them. And of course, they'll accuse the left and me of being soft and wanting to cower in fear as Iran threatens war. No, you're deliberately misunderstanding this. If that's what you think I'm saying, I have been abundantly clear that Iran is a belligerent, unhinged theocracy with an increasingly secular young population that doesn't want conflict with the United States, right? That That's what's going on in Iran. We had a good thing going. We had a deal, not a perfect deal, but a pretty good deal. And as long as the United States kept up its end, meaning you stay in the deal if Iran doesn't violate it, then we have leverage over them if they go rogue. In other words, if we do our part and stay in the deal, and Iran goes rogue, violates that deal. Now we actually have political capital to spend when it comes to a response. But now in comes Trump, wants to undo anything with Barack Obama's name on it, including the Iran deal. And that is going uh, now out of the way to provoke Iran in addition to threatening, quote, the strongest sanctions in history when Iran hasn't violated the deal. So I'm here saying, if Iran does something in violation of the deal, then the US is actually in a better position to retaliate. We could debate at that time, what is the retaliation that Trump wants and does that make sense? But at least we can say Iran violated the deal, now there can be repercussions. But when Iran has cooperated to the extent that we can check and the US simply says, nah, we're out, Obama was wrong to do, do the deal, we're gonna put on the strongest sanctions in history, that is irrational hostility towards Iran. And I'm not saying Iran doesn't deserve sanctions. I'm not saying Iran is a geopolitical partner to be trusted. They are not a geopolitical partner to be trusted. But if you have something that appears to be keeping them less escalated and agitated, and the Iran deal seemed to be doing that, 
build on it rather than destroy it. And uh, Iran is an extremist nation like many others we have to deal with. If you've got more control, uh, if you've gotten them more under control than others, then maybe focus elsewhere, right? Focus on Russian active measures instead of rewarding Russia for their bad behavior or focus on Saudi Arabia's extremist regime instead of selling them weapons or work on getting some concessions from Israel instead of moving the embassy to Jerusalem, right? Don't go out of your way to anger Iran for no reason whatsoever. As far as the people who are skipping the geopolitics, because there are people who are ignoring the fact that we are causing Iran to escalate by virtue of the haphazard pulling out of the Iran deal or announcement of the pulling out of the Iran deal, threats of the strongest sanctions ever. Skipping the geopolitics, there are some people who are going to bring it on and we can destroy Iran in a war. Iran has nothing on us militarily. Yeah, our, our military is much bigger than Iran's, but Iran isn't Iraq. Iran has a massive military compared to Iraq, and war with Iran would be a completely different thing than Iraq. I'm not saying the United States would, quote, lose, but you have to remember that in, quote, winning against Iraq, uh, if you believe that we did, we suffered 4,000 or more American service member casualties, likely 100,000 or more Iraqi civilians died. And the idea that there's going to be anything even remotely similar if we were to go with Iran is an absolute and total joke. But I, I actually don't think that's the right conversation now. The correct conversation is why is Trump ruining something that was at least going OK and going better than it had been for years? And the fear, the threat now becomes is Trump more unhinged by these threats than Iran is by our backing out of the nuclear deal? And does Trump start to proactively plan for or push for or drive to war with Iran? And if he is, who's going to stop him? We know he wanted to go to war with Venezuela and he was talked out of it. We know that he was starting to get belligerent about military action against North Korea. And fortunately, that hasn't happened. I don't know if we can count on Chief of Staff John Kelly, because he's increasingly at odds with Trump. Stephen Miller is not going to talk Trump out of a war with Iran. Is John Bolton going to talk Trump out of a war with Iran? This is why we have to be extraordinarily concerned. And remember, supposedly, it was Hillary who was going to get us into multiple wars. It's Trump who's been pushing for multiple wars behind the scenes. I have been telling you about the Orwellian newspeak that has been scaling up from Trump and the administration lately. They're making claims that aren't just inaccurate, but the are they're the exact opposite of reality in many cases. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is a strategy and this is a strategy to make people question whether they can believe anything that they hear at all. And we've talked about the dynamics of how that works before. If Trump says, I don't know, pick a topic, uh, Stormy Daniels, I don't know who she is. I met her. We didn't pay anything. We paid, but it was Cohen's money, but I didn't pay him back, but I did pay him back. All of a sudden, it becomes sort of like a non-issue in the mind of Trumpist because they've heard every possible side of that issue espoused by Donald Trump, at least at some point. They don't know what to believe. They'll go back to seeing the Red Sox Yankee game instead and then not worry anymore about what actually is the truth about Stormy Daniels. Trump is now using this strategy on Trump Russia. He is now claiming that he's worried that Russia will meddle in the 2018 midterms to help Democrats. This is straight up concern trolling. Check out Trump's tweet from yesterday where he said, quote, I'm very concerned that Russia will be fighting very hard to have an impact on the upcoming election. Yeah, OK, well, that part's true. And he goes on to say, based on the fact that no president has been tougher on Russia than me, <laughs> They will be pushing very hard for the Democrats. They definitely don't want Trump. Now, of course, none of that is true. There's no evidence that Russia is trying to help Democrats. Trump certainly hasn't been the toughest president on Russia. And all the evidence is that Russia does want Trump. Now, I do want to say, OK, before we get on to like the bulk of the analysis, Russia's goals are broader than Trump per se. So Trump is a means to an end. He makes the US look terrible. He makes Putin look better and stronger in comparison. He destabilizes American democracy and makes people question whether our, our democratic system is even working. It's possible that Dr Russia would help Democrats. Like if Russia determined that that would be the next thing, like if Russia determined that, okay, Trump, we help Trump win and, and things are crazy, 
let's now create even more chaos by helping Democrats achieve a majority in the House Senate or both because of how it will further unhinge Trump. That is how Russia thinks. There's just no evidence that that's actually going on right now. Well, yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear that in 2012 they favored Barack Obama over Mitt Romney, right? But in 2016, is it? what do you mean by that? I've never heard. Well, what Mitt do you Romney mean? was pretty tough on Russia, and oh, the idea okay, was fair. that they, they liked Obama more. Fair enough. But in the recent Helsinki summit, Putin said that he wanted Trump to win, right? Yeah. Because that would normalize uh, normalize relations between the U.S. and Russia. So this is gaslighting. That's ultimately what it is. This is another example of projection. It's Orwellian newspeak, where everything is the opposite, and this is now something that someone is feeding Donald Trump. I actually don't think that Trump is coming up with this himself anymore. I think that somebody is feeding to Trump. Take the line that Russia wants the Dems to win. And this is also another de facto attack on American intelligence, by the way. Trump's not saying it in his tweet. In Trump's tweet, he just says Russia wants the Dems. But we know that the consensus of the intelligence community is that Russia meddled to help Trump. When Trump says the opposite, when Trump says, I've been super tough on Russia and Russia wants the Dems, that's sort of a de facto way of Trump saying he doesn't believe the intelligence community. And this is monstrous, dangerous gaslighting. And it's only dangerous because people will believe it and will be tricked by it, period. If we had a voting public overall that saw this and said that that's not true, we know what the truth is and this isn't it. It wouldn't be so dangerous, but it's dangerous because there are a lot of people out there who are going to believe this stuff. And if we needed more proof that Trump isn't really worried about Russia hacking the Democrats, uh, hacking to help Democrats, rather, it's that he's doing nothing about it. Right. Think about this for a second. If you're Trump or if you're a Republican and you want Republicans to win and you think Russia's helping Democrats, you would immediately try to stop Russian meddling. Trump hasn't tried to stop Russian meddling. And in fact, he said just last week how strong and tough Putin was in his denials that meddling even took place. And additionally, Republicans just blocked a bid to uh, a bill rather to extend election security grants. If you run the House and Senate and you think Russia's helping the Democrats, why would you block funding for election security? You would say, hey, we need to stop it because Russia wants the Dems. None of them believe that that's what's going on. Or those additional sanctioned over sanctions overwhelmingly uh, passed by Congress that Trump for the longest time refused to implement. They would that's say implement them. Too. Implement them. It's not insane to say we can imagine why Russia might want Democrats to win over Republicans. We could we could imagine that circumstance, but there's no evidence that that's going on. It goes completely counter to what our intelligence agencies are saying. And three, if anybody believes that that's what Russia's doing, they're doing nothing to try to prevent it, which is what makes it abundantly clear that this is a show. It's a gong show. It's a joke. And more importantly, it's working. I was trolling some of the not actually I wasn't posting anything, but I was sort of browsing some of the known Internet enclaves of the most committed Trumpists. And they are they are now saying uh, Russia wants the Democrats. Russia wants the Democrats to win. And we need to vote in November because otherwise Russia and the Dems will take the House and Senate. So it's working. Any harebrained notion that is presented by Trump is now being taken as gospel by Trumpists. And that's why this stuff is so abundantly dangerous.